On episode 119 of the Vincast, I chat with Greg Lambrecht, wine lover and inventor of the Coravan device. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of The Vincast. My name is James Gasbrook, otherwise known as the Intrepid Wino. And uh, unfortunately, I have to apologize again for uh, not having a new episode uh, to share with you. Um, of course, um, life sometimes gets in the way uh, and I have uh, not really had heaps of time, but uh, I have been sitting on an uh, episode for a couple of weeks with uh, a really amazing guy um, who has created uh, a really game-changing piece of technology for the wine industry. Uh, and uh, it was really awesome to meet him. He's a lovely guy and uh, and learnt a lot about um the, the concept of the device, which is the Coravan device, uh, and Greg Lambrecht, who um, still has uh, you know businesses in uh, in medical technology, and uh, and that's kind of his background. That's where he got the idea for the device. So uh, it was fascinating to find out more about that. Uh, I do hope you enjoyed this episode. Please stick around. It is a bit of a long one uh, for this time, but you know, it was such a, 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 a interesting chat. Uh, stick around to the end so you can find out how to get in touch with Greg and myself if you did enjoy it. Uh, uh, and uh, I'll see you on the other side. Greg, thank you very much for uh, making some time on your whirlwind tour of Australia, um, launching uh, this very, very exciting new development for, for Coravan uh, to, to, to sit down with me um, and, and welcome uh, on the Vincast. Ah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, Greg, I uh, start every episode of my podcast asking pretty much the same question. Um, was there an experience in your life with wine that made you think about it in a different way, um, that that made you appreciate it more and, and possibly led to you ending up having some connection with the wine industry? Oh, I would say there's, there's certainly two experiences that led to my love of wine. And uh, the first one was illegal. I was 16. I was in Napa Valley. I was brought in because I looked older than my friends. I looked like I was 21 and uh, walked into my first winery, whose name I should ho- hold off on. Come on, statute of okay, limitations. Yeah, it's probably okay. Peju uh, okay. Winery, and it's a classic Napa Cab. It's a great producer. This is his first vintage. Uh, I walked in with my beard, trying to look as old as possible. It's before they had their vineyard. They had a barn. Uh, and uh, I, I asked for a taste of wine. My family is Austrian and German. They drank schnapps and beer, uh-huh. uh, but not wine. So I really hadn't had it uh, as a kid. And uh, I remember that first wine that he poured me and I tasted, uh, I thought, this is the best thing I've ever tasted. At 16? Yeah. Oh, wow. Explain to me. With no experience of alcohol no, before? Uh, no. I, I'd, had, uh, I'd had schnapps. Sure. Uh, as I a mean, five-year-old. that's going to taste good as a kid because it's got sweetness. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but I wasn't excited by schnapps. No. Um, I mean, it was okay, but I didn't, I wasn't, it wasn't anything other than alcohol. Sure. Uh, but wine I th- was I think that's kind different. of why the Germans like it. <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> why so I like it now. Uh, <laughs> but it was, uh, it was really transformative. I, I fell in love with it then. Uh, I spent the next 40 minutes tasting wine with a guy. Wow. He was psyched. Barrel samples, everything. I mean, he, he was, somebody came in his door, you know. He Someone's just interested. Yeah, yeah. Someone's interested. Uh, and then I think the, the second one, uh, was, you know, I, I grew up in California and so I drank California wine, like all of us would just become really sort of focused on what's, what's around us, which is, which can be great, but there's such a big world of wine. Uh, met my wife, uh, in college, we were both in Boston, uh, and her family is European and, uh, we're always involved in wine. And her brother, uh, came up to me one day and he goes, you got to stop drinking all that California wine. You've got to try uh, something really, really transformational. What, what are you talking about? And you must be wrong. Uh, and he poured me 1990s Shave Hermitage. Wow. Uh, and this was like 90... Good vintage. Nine? Oh, it was crushing. And uh, the thing that hit me was how that wine didn't taste anything like a grape. Sure. Like it wasn't even a distant relative to a grape. And that, that people have been involved with wine for so long, especially Hermitage, which is almost undrinkable when it's young. And then, you know, 10, 15 years later, it changes into forest and earth and pine. And then 20 years later, it's blood and meat. Uh, that we have this relationship with this plant for so long that we know that this is going to happen. 
Um, and that somebody knows when the winemaker is making that wine, they know, oh, yeah, it tastes like pepper now. Perfect. It's going to be great in 20 years, right? That we can think that long term. And I've been working with this plant for so long. Uh, that really set me off. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that was 97 uh, when that happened. To be honest, I think there's probably a lot of Australian wine consumers who had similar kind of experiences. I guess maybe not as much now in terms of Australian wine, but wines from Australia in the you know the 90s and early 2000s, similar to California wines, is like they taste like they're from fruit grown under a, a lovely sunny sky. Yeah. You know, I remember uh, um, I was lucky enough to get a, a, a visit to Schaefer when I, when I went to Napa. Great. And, um, and I can't remember the gentleman's name who looked after me, um, but he said, like, um, because, you, you know, you're traveling and, you know, learning about wine will happily kind of comp your, your visit as long as you promise to tell everyone that, you know, Californian wines and wines made of sunshine. <laughs> and I was like, we have those in Australia too. But yeah, anyway. yeah, yeah. The sun shines everywhere, really. I mean, it's a it's a great wine, but it's the classic uh, California Cab, big uh, California Cab. Yeah, um, and those are great, right? Absolutely. But you don't want to eat steak every day. No. Uh, and the the beautiful thing about wine now is the incredible variety that's being made. Of course. Uh, I mean that. that I mean, you can get the same grape all over the world, but it doesn't taste at all the same. I mean, you get a, a hopefully like that, yeah. That's the that's the interesting thing is that you can when when you do see when the same grape looks different in different places. Obviously, Burgundy is the ultimate example of that, but you know, in different parts of the world, it should taste different. I don't want a Burgundy from Oregon. I want an Oregon exactly. Chardonnay absolutely. From and, I, and 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 I think that in Australia and and I'm sure in the United States there has been a problem where. People are trying to ape that style or they're claiming it as, oh, this is a Chablis-style Chardonnay. Oh, yeah. this is a Burgundian-style Pinot Noir. It's like, make it, make it, make it your own. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, wine should speak to place and, uh, and the maker. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's not like all the wines in Chablis are the same. No. Right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> what, so what just, so, so to kind of categorize them all as a certain style is, is a bit redundant. Yeah. Uh, maybe. I mean, commercial success, it's – I'm not in the wine industry. I work in medicine. And uh, – uh, that's where I started, at least. Now, through Corbin, I guess I'm in the wine industry. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I was shocked by one of the Italian producers says, it's 40,000 different wines bottled in Italy every year. Mm-hmm. And if you think about that competition, it's insane. And that's just one country. Right? That's just one that country. That happens to be one of the top three largest producers. Yeah. But even so, I mean, let's say there's 120,000, 150,000 different wines bottled every year. How do you get known? It's a it's a much harder job um, than I realized uh, when I came in just as a wine consumer. Sure, uh, what these guys have to go through to actually make their product known. And you you realize most wine is consumed very locally by people who know the producer, right? Probably sure. worldwide. Sure, sure. Uh, and I f- I'm frustrated by that personally because I love Tasmanian wine, and okay. I don't think it makes it much further north than Melbourne. Right. It's hard to get Tasmanian wine other than a couple of producers in the Spark- United States. Sparkling wine's getting out a little bit because yeah. because it's considered to be you know the region in Australia for for sparkling wine. But yeah, you, you are probably right um, that Tasmanian wine doesn't get far enough. Yeah, probably needs to you know yeah, they don't when, when you see how far New Zealand wine travels, for example, it's like it makes sense that Tasmanian wine would be you know traveling to the same sort of destinations. But um, so it was during your college years in Boston and meeting your, who, who, who became, became wife. your wife. Yeah. That was what, a fairly, pretty important transformative period as far as your wine consumption, your Absolutely. wine education. Absolutely. Well, luckily, so I married somebody who loved wine as well. Mm-hmm. Um, that was a that was a good thing. So that doubles the uh, consumption capacity, right? So uh, all we those have, days. You have someone to enjoy wine. That's with. it. And, and, a, and a bottle is sold in a volume that is meant to be consumed by more than one person. That's the great thing about wine. The unique thing about wine is that, you know, it, it is something that, needs to be shared. I think it, it, it is and it is Maybe isn't. not so much now with the car event. Yeah, well, that, actually, <laughs> and, and I'll, I'll, I'll challenge you on that. Um, wine, my wife and I opened wine on days when it made sense to do so. Sure. So like on a Friday or a Saturday okay. when friends were over. Yep. But I wanted a perfect glass of wine every day. Yep. And wine is not built for that. Um, it, it's unless you go out to restaurants or wine bars who have tons of wine that they could open. Um, because they knew they had enough people coming by that they're ultimately going to get through that bottle. Or like in Europe, you have a big family. Yeah, a big family. But you're starting off. I was young. Mm -hmm. You know, I was 29 years old when I invented Corbin. We had one kid. You know, he's three years old. I'm not drinking a bottle of wine, uh, taking care of the three-year-old. My wife was pregnant. 
Uh, so she stopped drinking. And in that situation, a bottle, the volume of a bottle doesn't make sense very often. Sure. Um, and so I realized, actually, when I was, uh, I guess, a, a young medical device guy, uh, that, that uh, I was locked into consumption by the volume it was sold. Sure. Uh, and I didn't want that. Sure. Uh, I wanted uh, whatever I wanted to drink, whenever I wanted to drink it, however much of it I wanted, uh, without having to commit to the rest of the bottle. And if I, if I was going to have two wines in a night, I wanted them to be two different glasses of wine. Sure. Uh, and, and it was that really that triggered that and the pressure of my wife being pregnant and stopping drinking entirely uh, that triggered the, the necessity for Coravin for me. Well, what do they say about invention? Is it the mother of all necessity? It, it is, uh, I, I, or yeah, necessity is the mother of necessity, invention. Necessity, sorry, the other way around. No, I, I, in my whole career is inventing medical devices, and I always start with the unmet need. Uh, mm-hmm. That's that's what matters. Sure. Right. The technology to address that need can change. Sure. Uh, but what doesn't change is the problem. Yep. Right. Uh, yep. You've got the patient with a disorder, and they want to come out with a, a positive outcome, and what happens in the middle can change. Uh, and but, so, I, but but in your twenties, you know, whether being at college or when you started working. Um, you you were starting to explore a little bit broad more broadly with wine. Do you think that possibly like in in those early days when you were in Boston, I'm not sure where you ended up yeah. working after that, but like access to a broader range of wine, so that changed things a little bit. I mean, yeah, it did. Uh, certainly, the interest level of my wife, she loves uh, Barolo and and uh, and Babadesco, so she's a big Italian lover, and I, I love those wines now too as a result of her, and she's also a big Champagne uh, lover. That's that's another world of wine that you can explore. And we were tasting through as much wine as we could. But in, in, honest, in all honesty, I work in medicine. Doctors drink a lot of wine. And so, you know, you would go out to dinner with people after you started off a clinical trial or something like that. And, and I did a lot of trials in Europe. Uh, so I would be in Germany or in Austria or in France or wherever it was, or Slovenia even. And uh, they would say, oh, you've got to try this. Mm-hmm. Oh, you've got to try this. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I got to the point where I was like, you know, the the per, almost the perfect life would be constantly trying new things. Sure. Uh, to see, I mean, it was how different not only each of these grapes were, like Croatian Malvasia or Croatian uh, uh, Plavac Mali, pre, uh, the precursor to Zinfandel, uh, how different that wine was than what I was used to experiencing yep. uh, in the States. And all the different flavors that were out there, uh, I, I, I realized that wine was an infinite study, that I was never going to get bored. Uh, that I was always able to have a new experience. And it was, you know, back I think when I was in the States before I was traveling for work, um, I gained those different experiences by watching a wine get older right? and going through whatever metamorphosis it's going to go through. So uh, so you had an appreciation for cellaring and, and drinking wines with some maturity. I didn't have a whole lot of money, um, but I, so I, I, I relied on the largesse of others. Uh, and luckily my wife's family collects a lot of wine and, and my wife's grandfather had Inglenook from the 60s and 50s from California and BV from the 70s. Wow. Uh, so, and he would do tastings when we come over for Thanksgiving, my, my favorite holiday. And Is he friends it, with Francis Ford Coppola by the <laughs> He's a doctor. He's a, he's a great surgeon. He was the head <laughs> of the university hospital. He's a remarkable man, now in his 90s. Um, so not able to drink anymore. Uh, and, and had, you know, I think when he stopped drinking, he had a cellar of over 1,000 bottles. And it's something I, I said, and I remember talking to him about this, because uh, I learned so much from him. It, it, he was in his late 70s, and I think he had 3,000 bottles in his cellar. Uh, so he'd been collecting his entire life long when Bordeaux was cheap. Uh, so he had a bunch of 61 Bordeaux, which were you know, life-changing. And, and it, I had an early prototype of the Coravin, uh, and I went over to visit him, and, and uh, he said, yeah, we need to use that. We have to taste this 61. Uh, and I was like, oh, yeah, that'd be great. And we, we poured it. And I said, why don't you drink this? You're in your 70s. You've got cases of this stuff. He goes, it's too good to drink. Uh, it's not the right occasion. It's not a piece of art. Exactly. And, and in, if it is a piece of art, it's like a mandala or something. It's meant to be destroyed, yeah. right? It's uh, meant to be consumed. And I, I feel like there's all this wine. How much Chateau Chem is still sitting around from the, the 1800s, 1900s, you know? People thought it was so precious that, you know, we can't drink this. Yeah. And uh, one of my dreams with Coravin is to take that concept away. Oh, it's too good to drink. Uh, have a glass, uh, right? It's not too good to drink. It's, it's one of those things. And I think it, it actually, um, it's in one of my favorite scenes in the film Sideways, um, where they talk about 
like waiting for the right opportunity, the right occasion to open a really special bottle. Yeah. And I think um, it's Virginia Madsen's character who says, when you open that special bottle, that's the occasion. Yeah. doesn't matter what's going on, whether it's an anniversary or a birthday or Christmas or Thanksgiving, whatever it might be. Opening that bottle, that becomes the occasion. So you can do whatever you want around that, but, you know, open that special bottle. It does. I, you know, it's, it comes back to that thing I said earlier. I wanted the perfect glass of wine every day. And it's a different wine for every day. And for me, it's, it's not necessarily opening that bottle and finishing that wine. It's having that great glass. There's a, there's a, there's a uh, I'll reference another movie, the movie Psalm. Uh, I've gotten to know those guys pretty well through Coravin as a result. They were all some of the first restaurants that used Coravin when we were in our test phase. Uh, but uh, Ian Cobble has an opening line where he's like, the special thing about wine is you, know, you sit there and you focus on something you know, for minutes, you know, how often in your day do you get a chance to sit there and focus on something so intently uh, that is just a liquid in a glass? Uh, that's almost like, for me, meditation. Sure. Uh, and all the complex smells and tastes that wine can make can, can be so surprising. And then there's you in that moment with that glass, and you've had whatever kind of day you've had. Right, and you bring to the table the same thing that wine is bringing to the table. It's in a certain position in its life, and you're in a certain position in your life. It, that it, intersection is great. In that way, like I, I did a, a course at university um, on sort of postmodernism and the idea of um, that something that uh, a, a creator, an auteur, um, creates, as soon as they stop creating and they make it, they, they make it available to the public it ceases to belong to them because it's up to the individual to to interpret it in their own way. And every person has different experiences and different ideas. And so they might find meaning in something, whether it's a you know a, some literature or a film or a piece of music, they might have a different idea of it based on, on whatever is going on in their life at the time. And that's kind of something that I, I, I really appreciated with wine very early on was that there are so many things that go into a bottle of wine, but once it's in that bottle and the seal is put on it, it then becomes someone else's experience. They have complete ownership. And when you open that bottle, when you enjoy that glass of wine, it's entirely your experience. And so in the same way, you know, having the same wine on two different days might be a completely different experience. That's a, it's something that my wife and I have done uh, with Coravin. We, we buy a case of wine, 12 different bottles uh, from a vintage and uh, we'll put a sticker on the back of it and uh, we'll Coravin a glass for each of us together and write something uh, about that wine and, on the, and the, about that day and then we come back to that bottle six years later. Right, so every year we're trying one of the bottles and uh, so you, you, you come back six years later and you taste another one and you see the note that you wrote uh, to each other and about that time. It was, there was a sommelier in uh, Oh man, where was he? Germany, uh, who said, "A wine is an experience. Drinking a wine is an experience." And his comment about Corbin was, "You've proven to me that it's a, it can be a series of experiences, and you can have that bottle like that." My grandfather-in-law gave me a bottle of this uh, sixty-one Aubryon, which is still one of the most mind-bending experiences I've ever had. It is such, it you Corbin it into a glass, you can smell it from across the room. Um, I took that bottle around the planet and with Corbin and shared it with 13 different people. Um, and, and to be able to do that with something that's uh, clearly a diminishing entity, right? There's fewer and fewer 61s left. Uh, there's never any more of them. Um, the equivalent in Australia is, um, I'm not sure if you've heard of a, a guy named Morris O'Shea. Uh -huh. He was um, he's possibly one of the most cult Australian winemakers um, he made uh, Mount Pleasant. Yeah, sure, Mount Valley. Pleasant. Yeah, Fucking so awesome. so they so they talk about um, O'Shea wines, as in because he, he I think he only had about fifteen or twenty vintages, and so like they are as rare as hen's teeth. And James Halliday has you know has some bottles, and so cool. like wine you know wine professionals and wine writers talk about you know oh, I had an O'Shea bottle. So I'm sure it's the same thing. Like you know sixty one Oberon. Oh my god. Yeah, it's crazy good. You know, it's uh, the relationship that these winemakers over the centuries have developed with their product, uh, their ability to craft. The, it is art. They're farmers, but it's art. But but that one bottle was it, and was always a different experience. And that's from one bottle. It is, and it, and it traveled with me 
I, I, one of my favorite Corvin experiences, so I, I do these big blind tasting series, and I buy six bottles of the same wine, and then I Corvin it on day one, and come back in a month, I Corvin the new bottle and the original one, and I blind taste, and then I come back at three months, add another bottle, then six months, then two years, and then five years, and that's mm-hmm. sort of how I developed Corvin. After a while, it, I realized it worked, so I stopped doing the five-year tests on some of these wines. So I still have Corvin bottles from 13 years ago now, uh, some of these early tests. And I've done some blind tastings with Masters of Wine and Master Sommelier uh, out past 10 years uh, and been successful. But I have all these things where I, I write notes about the wine on the bottle. I sign and date it, uh, wrote the gas I was using, because I tried different gases, the, the, the needle I was using, the, the, the version of Corvin, the prototype that it was, just for my own record, and a note about the wine. And uh, just recently, I went down um, into my cellar and I grabbed one of these bottles, and it says, uh, "You know, this stuff is crap." <laughs> on the on the on my note, never buy it again. And that'll hold you off from doing a blind tasting with that wine, right? <laughs> it was written on a I had just corvin that bottle; it's fresh out of the bottle, and, and I really didn't like it. And uh, I brought it upstairs and I poured it and I tasted it. And I was like, I kind of like this. So I went downstairs and I grabbed another bottle of the same wine, still not access, poured it, uh, and it was great. They're, and they were the same; they were identical. So and, I had, and then it shows you how much your palate had changed, and also and my personality. With the day ex- with I had with experience, yeah. It's it's not just palate. Uh, the mood that you have, and people have shown music makes a difference. Uh, you bring to that experience the same thing. You bring your day to that glass. Yeah, and. Uh, it's something that I love about it, that it can be, you know, crap on one day and then another day and it, and it can be something that excites you because you've had a different experience or different food or whatever. It absolutely is one of those things. And I think certainly in Australia, it, it possibly has more in, in ter- it has more to do with, I guess, bottle variation to do with, with cork. Sure. Yeah. Um, with screw cap, it, it, it's a lot rarer, but you do, there is bottle to bottle there, there are different. And that's kind of part of the experience being different every time is if, because you open a different bottle it'll be a little bit different yeah. now with caravan you know it's like not necessarily bottle to bottle but glass to glass the yeah. same bottle and so you might have a different experience from the same bottle yeah. but different glasses at different times yeah and, and that's then that's quite it's quite a, 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 interesting it, it also ages i mean I, I one of my favorite wines is, is well grapes is syrah so i really love Cote Roti and hermitage and, and stuff like that and the thing that I love about it is that it changes so much over time. And uh, so when I, when I buy a bottle, even when it's too young, I taste it immediately. It tastes like pepper and all this stuff. And, and then you taste it as time goes on, and it changes. It goes through this metamorphosis. And it does so whether you core it or, or you don't. Sure. Um, and, and so wines age, uh, and, and they change as they age. We change. Uh, as we age, ten years go by. I see it in my passport. Holy cow! Uh, you age, right? And uh, your nose changes. Certainly, my eyesight's beginning to change. I'm sure my palate changes. You like different foods. You've experienced different things. Um, it, it's a wine is something that connects us to the passage of time in in such extraordinary ways. Uh, and and to, and to add Coravin into that, I, I I don't want Coravin to be something that. Uh, disrupts in a negative way uh, the wine industry. I still pull corks. Friends come over, we, we open bottles. Um, I just wanted to be able to expand our relationship with wine, to be able to experience it in different ways. You know, pairing at home, you get three different wines in an evening. Why not? You know, uh, uh, have, a, have a Sibli, a Riesling, and then a Bordeaux, or, a, or now, uh, hopefully, uh, Australian wines uh, under screw cap mm. uh, with Corbin. I I want I want to be able to drink and experience any wine, any closure, sparkling or still, uh, in the speed and the time that I want to experience it. And uh, I'm hoping I'm hoping that Corvin does that for for other people as well. You're, there, something you said about um, once you've invented something or, or written something, you put it out there. It's it's not yours anymore. Um, and it, in, in consumer products, you also have to recognize it's not yours anymore after you invent it and hire a, a team because they change it, right? Their insights affect it. I didn't make this Coravin, right? I made a pre- precursor to this Coravin. We have an amazing team that made that happen. Uh, and then when it goes out into the, when it went out into the field, I knew nothing about the wine industry. The way it's being used now, I would never predict. I, I didn't know wineries would use it to serve wine. I didn't know... Uh, I knew restaurants would use it to serve by the glass, I guess. 
Uh, but I didn't know about wine distributors and wine sales forces and wine stores using it. Th- this was a cool thing, and I don't know why I didn't think of it. Wine stores use it to sample their customers on a wine before they buy it. And I was talking to this guy who worked at a wine store. He's like, think of my job. It's like I'm going to sell you a pair of shoes. It's an expensive pair of shoes. And I'm going to tell you you can't try them on. Yeah. <laughs> Or, I mean, you can't even see it, pretty yeah, much. No, that, in fact... I can, I'll, I'll describe it to you, <laughs> and that's all you'll get. Try it on in 10 years. Just trust me. <laughs> it's going to be great in 10 years. Yeah, yeah. Buy it now, <laughs> but you can't wear it <laughs> for 10 to 15 years. It, it's goofy. They'll feel great then, though. <laughs> exactly. Like, if you wear them in the next 10 years, yeah. man, they'll be and so it, uncomfortable <laughs> and really awkward. Right. And if you don't like it, hopefully you don't remember who sold it to you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a weird... There's a 10% chance <laughs> that there might be something wrong. The sole will just fall off. <laughs> <laughs> and you can only wear it once. <laughs> but no, that's, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, like, you know, because I have experience working in, in, one, in one retail and, you know, trying to justify a customer spending $100 or more on a bottle of wine, you know, like that's why there is so much requirement too for us to be very knowledgeable and to be able to explain why a wine is more expensive and why it's special and why this one is a perfect gift for your father-in-law huh. um, on his on his 60th birthday. Um, to be able to have the opportunity to try before you buy, which was something that was completely unheard of yeah. in the wine industry unless you actually just open a bottle, um, you know, and like if you open a bottle of $100 retail wine, you want to make sure that as many people try it as possible. So having the caravan means that you don't have to feel pressured to invite 50 of your best customers. Yeah, come on a Thursday yeah. and uh, you know, yeah, hopefully you're exactly. in town. Exactly. Right. As opposed to, yeah, come on in, let me taste you something. And, and then, and then, you know, even then like you might charge $20 per person yeah. to be able to taste this or, you know, a range of wines. But now with the caravan, it's just like, you it's, want to try it. I have this bottle. And you know, and and you taste, you show it to six, twelve people, and you've sold a case. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's a uh, so it was Lavinia. So it's paid for itself. It, it was Lavinia in Paris who invented this concept. It's a great wine store, and it's sort of spread from yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, and I, I was, it was talking to the to the manager of of the store, and he said, "We are fighting for the lowest common denominator in the wine store business. It's all going online, and it's price." Right, and it's if somebody knows they want something, they look for the cheapest place that they can buy that wine. Yeah, and they'll go online as opposed to the store. Exactly, and we're going to lose more and more and more business. Exactly. What is the only advantage we have as a wine store? It's tasting. Sure. Right. It's immediacy and tasting. So, I can. The only way I'm going to be successful as a store is if I can get people in taste, and that's my advantage. Right. Over you can't taste over the internet. Yeah. And, and this <laughs> is one of the things that I think is also going to be changing is that you are potentially taking away the influence and power of wine critics and experts because when they're coming out, and I know this for the company that I work for, we sell some really outstanding Italian red wines which people pay attention to vintage reports and ratings of you know Barolos and Brunellos and stuff like that. And particularly for retailers, they, they need that information because that's how they can pre-sell these wines. Yeah. If people have an opportunity to taste it before they buy, they can understand, they can enjoy it themselves and work out why they would like it and why they should buy it and why they should sell it importantly. Yeah. Like, you know, this is why you put, want to put this down for 10, 20 years. It's the, it's the fastest That's way. That's taking away the power of, of, of that, that I, critic. I see that power fading. I mean, it's the... It's like Yahoo Movies killed the uh, critic for movies or Rotten Tomatoes or all, all the other things that are out there. Yeah, well, you know, TripAdvisor, Yelp kill, yeah. killed restaurant reviews. Yeah, I mean, that's, I pay attention to it. Um, so I, through this, I've gotten to meet some fantastic people. And, and uh, um, uh, Robert Parker has become a friend. He's an f- uh, absolutely fantastic guy. And, and to be honest, he shaped my early wine experience. I'm that age, right? I'm, I'm of that, gen- of that, that era. Yeah. That era where he mattered. Yeah. And... Um, and I was, having, I was having lunch with him one day. Uh, anyway, I was talking about oh, how powerful you've become and all this other stuff. And he's like, you know, and I said, people criticize you for the influence you've had on the wine industry. And he said, look, all I did was write. People didn't have to read it. Right? All I did was write. Yep. And, uh, and I told him there are some wines he's rated really, really well I don't like. Um, but I learned that uh, if he wrote blueberry or blueberry fruit juice, I didn't like it. 
If he if blueberry appeared in his note, I knew that I was not going to like that wine. But he wrote leather. Bam. I, I was, I was going to love that. Didn't sure. matter what the score sure, was. Sure. And uh, and he said, actually, that was the thing that he worked on the most was to be consistent in his descriptions. Sure. Um, but I, I think that the power of the Raider is going away um, largely because everybody is at Vivino. I mean, you've got these apps that uh, that are rating it. Seller Tracker in the States. You can look up any wine from any vintage tasted wine, by 20 people. Wine searchers. Right, you wine can, searchers. You can find right you know, prices yeah. for vintages, yeah. I think, I think the, the great thing about that was the the democratization of the ratings has come along with this new generation of wine drinkers who are not beholden to sort of the the go-to grape varieties and the go-to winemaking uh, styles of my generation. Sure. Right? I mean, there, there's Chenin Blanc appearing everywhere. Uh, I don't know if I ever read a rating on a Chenin Blanc from Robert Barker. Uh, you know, there's, there's a really spectacular and creative... There's an explosion in style and variety and different grapes being used. We're growing everything in California now, anything. I mean, it's a lot like Australia, actually. I've seen the same thing happen here. And there are some awesome, geeky wines coming out of Australia. Tripiscariot, I just had the Chenin Blanc from Tripiscariot a little while ago. I was talking to somebody about it. It's an awesome frickin' wine. And I would never drink that and go, Australia. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, uh, and and this was one of the things because um, recently they they held the uh, the the top fifty restaurants in the world um, award ceremony here in Melbourne, and um, you know a lot of the sommeliers from the top restaurants were here, and Wine Australia um, were very involved with um, spending time with these soms from around the world uh, and introducing them to, you know, like showing them the the, the what what their perceptions of Australian wine possibly are is not necessarily a reflection of the entire industry. And there's a lot more classic Australian wine that is not representative of, you know, big Barossa Shiraz. Um, and and there's a lot of exciting new wines being made and we're being influenced, you know, in terms of the diversity of grape varieties. And so that's that's really exciting that, that like, it, it's happening everywhere. It is happening everywhere. and I mean, Australia is kind of... Um I, I I come from California. I think of Australia uh, as having a similar mindset to California. There there is tradition, but there's a total joy in breaking it uh, here, and and that's a wonderful thing to see. So I I think there's an almost an amplified or accelerated um, shift uh, away from the the Barossa Shiraz style uh, in Australia happening so quickly now, or maybe it's just my experience by coming here finally and and. Uh, having my own opportunity to visit, visiting the guys at Mosswood who were making epic wines. Cullen, uh, I dropped into Margaret River and, and going down to Tasmania uh, and literally drinking the wines that I can't get in the States. Uh, it's, it's beautiful. I, wine is made by good people in beautiful places all over the world. That's one of its characteristics. You make beer anywhere. Uh, but grapes grow in beautiful places, and they like hillsides, and hills are beautiful, and the air is clean, and the water is good. Uh, and the people that are involved are in it for a reason, right? There are very few people suffering through a life in the wine me- you know, <laughs> in the wine world. <laughs> well, I mean, the only suffering is like, I'm never going to be rich. Yeah, it's hard to make money. <laughs> and it's actually But it's a thing. Like, yeah. it's a choice you make. It's, yeah. it's a lifestyle thing. I was like, I, 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 my, my partner, I told her, like... You know, what I do for work, I'm never going to be, we're never going to be super wealthy, but we're going to be happy and we're going to be contented and we'll eat well and we'll drink well and our kids will appreciate that we enjoy life. Yeah, you can't, you can't buy joy and, uh, and you see it more and more. I, I've, I've, I can work very intensely. The medical device industry is very intense and there's a lot of risk and there's personal risk. You talk about an invention. If you put your invention into somebody's spine and they walk away, you're responsible, right? And you feel it. So there's a, there's a, there's a lot of pressure involved. There's joy in making somebody better. Uh, but, but I have to say that since starting Coravin, my, my level of joy has skyrocketed. Being introduced to the wine industry in the way that, that Corbin has enabled me to be introduced, to get into Burgundy houses and Bordeaux producers and here in Australia and, and uh, getting to meet the guys in Germany and the Rheingau and Austria and the Wachau and all these different places, to be able to go there and see it and meet the people and to put a place in context with the wine that I've been enjoying uh, and to know them 
uh, influences, alters the person that I bring to the glass. Effectively, what you've done is you've you've invented your own go- golden ticket. Yes, yes, it it just gets you into any <laughs> any any Wonka factory you no, could possibly this, imagine. This is my scheming face. <laughs> you know, this, this, it's all a crafty strategy to get. Have, have you always worked in terms of in, in the medical field as far as technology? And 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 I'm guessing that's kind of where you got the idea, like behind the needle and and extraction, that kind of thing. It is it is where Corvin came from. Is is from medicine. I'll, I'll go into that in a second. I, I, I did have a couple of careers. So I, I was very heavily influenced by my grandfather, who was unfortunately a weapons designer uh, for the German military in World War II. And, and he, he came, he was captured by the Americans, and then he made weapons for the U.S. Uh, and he, he said to me, he was, he was an older man, I was 12, and he was 82. And uh, he was dying. And he said, you know, you seem like a good chap. You, you, should, uh, you should work on power or medicine. We'll never have enough of either. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you think about now, he's right, right? Energy and, uh, and medicine are two uh, critical things in every culture. How do we get energy without polluting the environment? How do we, Maybe the other one would be water. Yeah, water is good too. Yeah, that, he didn't know about that. He, he was pre-global it went, warming. It wasn't as much of a problem then. <laughs> yeah, exa- it was. Population, population wasn't as bad as no, it got. It wasn't. It wasn't. But uh, he, he influenced me a lot. So I went and studied uh, plasma physics uh, to work on fusion power the kind that doesn't work. Uh, Fission is the one that works, fusion doesn't. But I thought, you know, if we could do what the sun does, uh, we could make power indefinitely without uh, running out. Turns out it doesn't work, and uh, I have very low expectations that it will. But solar power is great. We can use the exhaust uh, of fusion. And so I I left that field and went into uh, medicine, because that was the second thing he suggested. And it was a great suggestion. Uh, I'm... It's similar to winemakers that, that love being in the field that they're in, uh, there are quite a few people that work in medicine for the for the right reasons that are that are essentially altruists that are trying to solve a problem that either their family has had or or their friends have had and I generally work on ones my family has had so cardiac surgery cardiology and and now spine surgery don't, but then they call that the Lorenzo's oil thing? yeah yeah and and you know why not that's a great motivation uh, you do something for a reason might as well be that uh, you see a lot of uh, of ex sports guys who had blown out their knees in orthopedic surgery. Uh, you know, wow. being orthopedic surgeons. Yeah, okay. Because somebody treated them and it affected their sure. their thinking. So the the core of an the sense is, of giving back. Yeah, exactly. Uh, giving, and doing something that was so important to their lives. Yeah. Right? So uh, the the uh, the needle. Uh, I worked on chemotherapy delivery systems uh, very early on in my life, uh, design life, and um, and we made needles that didn't do damage to things as they went through them over and over again. Sure. Um, and so I knew how to make needles. So that's where really Corvin comes from. We pass that needle through the cork. And it's actually a spinal needle. I, I've been asked not to say that by our marketing department because it scares people. Um, but it is. It's a non-coring needle. And then um, I'd worked with uh, different gases in, uh, in plasma physics. Uh, and argon is one of the noble gases. So it's totally inert. Yeah. Uh, and so when I was trying out gases, I knew what to try. I think everybody brings their experience to an environment where there's an unmet need. Uh, and if you have the freedom to be able to take things from other fields and move them into a new one, that's normally the basis of invention, recognizing the need and then being agnostic to where the technology comes from. So w- the eureka moment where you kind of got the, you conceived of the idea of using the, the needle to, to, to permeate through the cork, did you look at the, a needle and go, I wonder if that could be applied to this? Or did you look at the cork and go, how can I get through it without opening it? You know, uh, so I, I start every company I do with a, a need statement. And I remember when my wife was pregnant, I was saying, I'm frustrated. Why am I frustrated? I'll write down a need statement for this, right? Just like I do in medicine. And I wrote down a way to preserve an open bottle of wine, a way to be able to drink that wine again uh, in a week, a month, or a year. And uh, then I wrote down a way to pour wine from a bottle without opening it. Because I remember like the, f- the earliest rumblings I heard of, about Coravan before it was, became available in Australia was, have you heard about this new thing that allows you to drink a bottle of wine without actually opening it? Yeah. So I call that the magic trick. And it's a little bit the curse of Coravan because um, it... You, it is a magic trick, and it's cool when you see it, right? You just leave the foil on or wax and go straight through it, straight through the cork, and you're, and you're pouring wine. Um, but what gets lost in the magic trick is the why. Uh, and, and the why is really the critical thing. I wanted a perfect glass any day of the week, 
whenever. And if I was going to have a second glass, it was going to be a different one. Um, that's the why. And the, what I, what I, my first statement was, I want, I want to be able to teleport a glass out of the bottle into my glass. That would be perfect. Um, and I very quickly went to the needle because I happen to have... You, you didn't happen to be a Star Trek fan. No, I am a big Star Trek fan. <laughs> Every geek is a big Star Trek fan, and with good reason. So, uh, so I had the needle. Um, I had some of my chemotherapy stuff, uh, and it was too short. So I had to go make uh, uh, another, another needle uh, to get through. And I, I, I was literally sitting in my kitchen with this bottle of wine. It was in a rented apartment. And, and a needle in my hand going, there's got to be a way. Yeah. And I, I did with a, a, I've run into a bunch of people who've tried it, doctors generally. They stick a needle through and they try to suck the wine out. But it creates a vacuum and it pulls the wine back in. So uh, I right. knew that I actually had to blow the wine out. Yep. So uh, push the wine out with something inert. Yep. And that's what led to the, to the gas. First day I got it working, I had five different wines. Like the first day that I had that prototype, I drank from five different bottles of the 40 that I had uh, in my house. And it totally changed. It's changed my life ever since. I, I don't drink wine the same way. Um, and I could never go back uh, to drinking it the same way. It took you about 10 years to kind of conceptualize and, and f- you know, f- finally get to your, you know, the, 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 the model of the caravan that you are happy with and you're ready to, to take it to market? You know, it's a, there's a great guy, uh, Stephen Jay Gould, who wrote about evolution. He was one of the big thinkers. He, he called something, he called evolution uh, punctuated equilibrium. It stays the same for a long time and then something really bad happens, like a meteorite strikes and kills everything except for the things that it doesn't. And then everything changes. It's not a continuous rise. And I'd say Corbin was definitely punctuated equilibrium. Uh, I was I had a day job. I was running uh, two medical companies uh, at the time. So I did this on weekends. And uh, I, I made a functioning prototype in 99, 2000, but it was barely functioning. And then I got to a reasonably good one in 2003. Um, and then a friend of mine was getting married. So I'd say about the, it was called the Wine Mosquito before it was Coromon. So this is Wine Mosquito 5 uh, that I was using. And uh, I had to get to uh, one that somebody else could use because this had dials and buttons and, you know, looked like a weapon. And so uh, I wanted to give it to him and have him enjoy his wines the way that he wanted to. And so I went through 10 iterations in that year and got to Mosquito 15. And uh, Mosquito 15 was really what I used uh, to do all the development testing. Uh, so between 2004 or five and 2011, when I started the company, I was doing blind tasting to convince myself that five years later, there'd be no difference. Sure. And so you had to wait five years. Yeah. And uh, I was doing it with Bordeaux, which I was drinking at the time. And then a friend came over and said, sure, it works with Bordeaux, but it'll never work with white burgundy. And so I went out and I bought a half case of white burgundy and started the test. And then, oh, it works with white burgundy. It'll never work with, you know, fill in the blank. So uh, I, I wound up having, well, going from 40 bottles to 2,400 bottles under some type of test. That was, uh, that took a lot of time and, I felt really certain uh, when we started the company that when you put the invention out there, you don't want it to damage something. You don't want to wreck somebody's saved bottle of wine, that experience they're waiting for. Uh, I felt really good about it. So, when, when, when you started to tell people you know, and, and, and say to them, you know, I'm, I'm going to show you how I can drink wine from this bottle without opening it, did they think that you were going to do that old trick where you put the bottle upside down, pour wine into the punt and drink from that? <laughs> Like I've never you, seen that you trick. Didn't, you didn't say, you no, didn't say no. I bet you $100 I can drink wine from this bottle without opening it. <laughs> That'd be awesome. I've never done that, and I'm, I'm now going to use that, except on Riesling, which is flat-bottomed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Perfect, perfect, that, perfect uh, with burgundy and champagne, I think. Yeah, exa- exactly. That's really cool. You, you never, you never, I never <laughs> said that it was going to be the wine in the bottle. <laughs> yeah, that's, very, that's very good. I will, I will definitely use that, and I will, I will quote you. No, in actual I, fact, I am actually going to extract wine. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, you know, people were shocked, and you still see it today. Uh, it's amazing doing a podcast or a radio interview and trying to describe what Corbin is. You sure. know, it's such a visual thing. Well, and, and in terms of a visual thing, like something you were just talking about, you know, that, uh, you know, the early prototypes, and, and still the Corbin today, it kind of does look 
a little bit like a weapon. So in, yep. a, in, in effect, what you've done is you've combined your, your grandfather's suggestions in terms of <laughs> power. Yeah, and, he and, he, and his background. He meant and, energy, but, not but his, his background in terms of weapons yeah. and, and the medical. So it's, it's an interesting kind of... Yeah, the, 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 it, it is. Uh, I'm not responsible for this particular industrial design other than I, I, I ran into an industrial designer. We hired a guy. Sure. And uh, we worked with them for three months. We just raised money and it was friends and family. And uh, we burned through a lot of money using this great industrial designer. And he, as soon as, soon as he hired, we hired him, took off to Latvia. And uh, we got somebody else. And uh, they came back after two months and a lot of money with something that looked terrible. Mm. And, and to prove it to them, I took my Mosquito 15 and their prototype and put it in front of people who didn't know it and said, which one do you like better? And they all pointed to mine. Yeah. And I was like, I made this in my basement. Yeah. You should be embarrassed. <laughs> right? And uh, he had come back, and in five minutes he sketched uh, the modern version of the Corbin. Wow. Which is five minutes. Yeah. And I was like, that's it. Uh, we, you know, we're, we're a new category. There's really nothing like us. Uh, so we wanted to have some sort of iconic thing that you can't, that look different from other things that we were seeing in the wine industry. I, I remember the, the, the thing that it was compared to was like because enematics yeah. were, were quite prominent. But people were saying, how would you like to have what an enigmatic does, but you can take it with you anywhere? In your hand. And everyone yeah. was like, that's crazy. I can't imagine what sort of device would you allow, allow you to do this. And then, they st- and then people would explain, you know, it uses a needle. It's like, that's genius. I can't believe no one thought of that before. Yeah. But, yeah. No, but, but, but I guess, and, and I think we've touched on it, you know, like wine in particular is such a traditional thing. And I'm sure you still get a lot of pushback from people saying, but you're ruining, you're changing what wine enjoyment is. You're, you're, you're breaking down these traditions. Wine has been enjoyed like this for hundreds and hundreds of years. And, and now you're just reinventing this thing. No, no, no. I, I'm not going to accept this. It's a, so it's an issue. Right, uh, wine's been with us for eight thousand years, and it's glass and cork for since the sixteen hundreds. Um, so a lot of tradition has evolved since the sixteen hundreds. Uh, what I always remind people of is when they invented cork and glass as a closure, they had no idea of how to get it out. The first corkscrews were invented in the late sixteen hundreds, early seventeen hundreds. Until then, they were tonging or shoving the cork in or breaking the bottle. There was no corkscrew. They designed and developed it as a closure mechanism that allowed, it was the first time you could pre- prevent oxidation and, and cellar wine for decades um, in, a, in a consumable, personal consumable uh, format. Um, so the wine bottle was a great invention. And, and yeah, there is pushback. And it, actually, w- just the same way that wine's, wine is a lens on a culture, how people consume wine in a culture varies by where you are. Coravin is a lens on a culture. How quickly are they willing to adopt a different technology, a different, a change? And, and I did get uh, pushback. It varies by country. I mean, California, New York, nobody cares. Hey, it's new, it's great, perfect, <laughs> right? Uh, Australia, a lot less of resistance, right? I think there's less of a tradition uh, reverence in Australia than there is in places like Germany. Or you mean the country that invented the, uh, the um, what do they call it, the, the, the bag and box yeah. wine, <laughs> the country that you know, pioneered <laughs> screw cap technology? That's right. Of course, we, we jumped on this new technology. Yeah, no, it's been quick in Australia. Uh, the, the, the resistance and the UK, I mean, the UK has been amazing for us. It's yeah, I mean, that's one of the few markets that, that happily will accept screw caps as yeah. for, for, for even for premium wine. So it, it, Australia Australia likes the UK for that one of the well, it's one of the reasons the UK they're, like they're the UK. amazing I mean we have uh, more restaurants using Corbin in London than anywhere else in the world um, uh, but uh, any city in the world the uh, the 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 French it's not France um, as a culture there are different regions of France and so you run into different forms of resistance in different reasons in Burgundy Sure, great. We have no volume. We can't make enough. Yeah. So we can't open all these bottles for people when they come by. I mean, we're running out of inventory. Bordeaux, on the other hand, like they've got farm. so much wine to sell. And it's like, no, 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 we don't want people to drink it slower. We want people to buy more. That, that, and that was exactly the pushback. There were two concerns in Bordeaux. One was um, was counterfeiting. Somehow Corvin's going to be used to counterfeit because they're getting counterfeited in China. And I, I told them that is not how your wine is counterfeited. Your wine is counterfeited by somebody making bottles because it's a lot cheaper to make two million bottles of wine that are fake. 
than it is to buy two million bottles of wine from you, drain them, and then refill them. Yeah, and it's just not the way mass counterfeiting. Happens. That's not counterfeiting. Counterfeiting, yeah. Counterfeiting yeah, is counterfeiting is ma- truly is making a fake. It. Yeah, not not. Yeah, yeah, no, it, yeah. It's not it's not financially lucrative. But um, we did get pushed back in Bordeaux. Bordeaux was the one, honestly, the one wine region where we got hit hard. Um, now it's not uniform. It, it's uh, Chateau Margaux was real quick to pick it up and uh, use it everywhere. Uh, Obaye was the first uh, French uh, winemaker that that uh, adopted Corbin very quickly. Uh, so, but there were pockets of real strong resistance there, and 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 over time that's changed, right? Uh, because they see that people are using it. It's, People are still opening bottles. This is just different occasions. And one of the weird things that happens with Corbin, people drink more expensive wine more often. Precisely. And, and, and I think, you know, from, from my experience working, um, uh, you know, as a, as a wine representative uh, selling to the trade, particularly in terms of restaurants, it's totally changed the by the glass option. Yeah. You know, one, you know a, a, a good customer friend of mine, um, Dinner by Heston, have like Loic is trying to have at least a hundred wines by the glass. I was there last night. He had 120. With, yeah, which he can <laughs> do finally with Coravan. And so he's so excited, and the Somme team are so excited to be able to offer these really rare wines, these more expensive and mature wines, to people that would otherwise not be buying a bottle. And you can't get. The, I, I commented on his wine list yesterday. I was like, you so know, more people can enjoy. Yeah, he's got one 1996 Predatory Barbaresco uh, Assi, right? How are you going to get a magnum of that? You can't go out and find that readily. And he's serving it to you by the glass. And he's yep. got three different glass volumes you can buy, yep. right? And and I was looking at it going, I really want to try that wine. And, and that, <laughs> that sort of comes back to something we talked about, about wine being a social thing where, you know, traditionally you open a bottle of wine and you wouldn't necessarily have it on your own. You, you do it with other people. In a way, the Coravan is opening it up even more so in that kind of environment where more people are able to enjoy one bottle of wine, you know, different tables, different groups of people, yeah. and they all have different experiences. And it's precious. It's it's diminishing, right? Fewer and fewer. And it's a great year. And, you know, it's he's got wacky producers in there, and he's willing to put it at risk because it's, he's not at risk. And he gets to create an experience for his customers that he wouldn't otherwise be able to do. I love I love that about Corbin and somebody like him. One of the coolest wine programs I've seen in the world, well, there's a couple of amazing places around the world. 67 Palm Mall is the benchmark. I think they're, they're up to 500 wines by the glass using Corbin. It's nuts. Uh, in London, they're they're fantastic. What an amazing place. Um, and then there, there was a restaurant in uh, in Northern California, in San Francisco, that they, they use Corbin, and uh, they basically say, everything on our list is by the half, gla- half bottle or full bottle. The entire list, you just open it up, and it's the, the bottle is one price, the half bottle is half that price. And it's, you always ask, is there, do you just find a wacky collection of half bottles of wine? And he said, no, I use the Corbin. I pour the first half of the bottle with Corbin into a decanter. You drink that. And when I sell the second half, I pull the cork, or I take, let's now take the screw cap, cap, on, cap off, and, and uh, pour the rest of the bottle. So he's, it's a, and it's a cool thing because you're always at a restaurant with somebody else. And so now instead of having one bottle, you have two different half bottles and you have twice the experience that, that you would have had. So I love it. The, the really exciting thing for me, I guess, thinking about it with Coravan is obviously it's still somewhat into an early adoption phase. Very much. Um, as, as more and more people start embracing it and the Coravan is used worldwide uh, at you know, restaurants, for example, from the top right down, I think it is going to have a extremely profound impact on the entire wine industry and the wine markets because people are going to have the opportunity to be exposed to more wine, to different wine, to better quality wine. And I would not be surprised if the average bottle price starts to creep up because of Coravan as a direct result of these wines being available. It might. I mean, or, or I mean, there's only so much Burgundy made, and like, I hope their prices can't go up any higher. Um, but I do think the access to fine wine is going to change. Uh, what my dream outcome is democratizing great wine so that you don't have to sit there and say, oh, I've never tried Chateau Camel. I'll never know what it tastes like. It's $500 a bottle, $600 a bottle. Somebody pours you a half a glass of wine of that for 40 bucks. You know, you didn't have to take the risk 
on a full bottle of really expensive wine to find out what it tastes like. I, I would argue that I, uh, I can't see myself drinking a whole bottle of Ikem anyway. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm with you there. You get diabetes. <laughs> uh, you know, we've done a lot for the sweet wine and, and port industry, right? Because it, it's hard to commit to a bottle of port, right? At a, especially at a restaurant. But even at home, um, I, I didn't used to drink um, dessert wines or sweet wines, not necessarily dessert wines. Now I do. Because uh, I'll have a, you know, you can have a shot glass of this stuff. And uh, it's such an explosive flavor such an amazingly powerful experience. You don't want a ton of it. Uh, and that and cheese is just perfection. There's some great, I've had some amazing sweet wines here. Henschke makes a badass, pardon my language, uh, no, no, sweet wine free. here. Lots of, lots of great wines in, that I'm running into in Australia. And I would never have said, oh, I've got room in, for, in my bag for six bottles. Yeah. I'm going to make one of those a sweet wine. Yeah. Because uh, when am I going to drink that? But now, you know, I have, I have these like twice a week, right? Uh, it's it changed my habits. It's changed my habits. I, I, my dream is democracy in wine and, and everybody gets to taste. When you do a disruptive thing, there's always fear of change. That's the pushback. Um, and, and people fear that, you know, the winemakers can fear that less of their wine is going to be consumed or opened. Or the uh, restaurants are going to fear that, you know, they're going to lose control of their inventory or, or you know, they, they, their customer is going to reject the look of Coravin and the poor. Um, and these are all things that happen initially. In medicine, they happen in spades, right? You, that's risk, um, is changing the way you practice medicine. Sure. Uh, you've really got to believe. But it's everywhere. And I, I, I'm working on all sorts of projects for Coravin that are technically really challenging. Um, but the hardest thing in any new technology is changing behavior, and and uh, and it's exposing people to the benefits of that new behavior. Uh, you know, one or two perfect glasses of wine every day is different than opening a bottle on a weekend uh, or when friends are over. Of course. Uh, and and it, getting somebody, I, I always say to people, if you're going to just preserve an open bottle, if you're going to just preserve a bottle for a week using Coravin, there are cheaper ways, right? If that's the wine you're going to be drinking, you don't need Coravin. Uh, but if you do want to try this white wine tonight and that red wine tomorrow and the, go to a wine store, it, people buy wine differently when they're, when they're big Corbin users. They go to a store and they buy six different bottles of wine. And they'll you know, go home and taste three of them. And they'll taste the other three. And they'll decide which one they want to open, right? Or they'll, or they'll have a glass of this one this night and a glass of that one that night. Um, as opposed to buying a bottle, drinking a bottle. Buying a bottle, drinking a bottle. Uh, it, it allows you to have more experience. And I... I, I'm sort of a zealot uh, to to, prosl- uh, to to promulgating that behavior because um, I've benefited from it so much. Uh, I love it. <laughs> so the reason you're here in Australia is to officially uh, launch uh, in this market, at least uh, at this stage, um, this new exciting um, addition to the Coravan device, which is um, a, an effort in effort to um, allow screw cap wines. Um, and of, of course, Australia is possibly the most famous example of using screw caps from the bottom to the top as far as quality. Um, the, this new addition uh, is allowing wines under screw cap to be to have the same benefits of, of wines under cork using the caravan. Boy, I hope so. And uh, and, and yeah, I think you know the, the reality in globally, it's twenty five percent of all wines are under screw cap, and they tend to be less uh, less expensive wines for no good reason. Uh, and I think Australia has proven... Again, tradition. Yeah, tradition. Australia has proven that you can be very successful with, uh, with expensive wines under screw cap. Screw cap's a great closure. Uh, and, and as I've learned, you need to make the wine for the closure. Uh, you need less SO2 and, and that type of thing. I've talked to a bunch of people that have switched. If you make the wine the same as you make it for cork and then just put a screw cap on it, you get too much SO2 over a long time. And, and people had to learn and go through those lessons. Those were learned here. Yeah, I remember early on I, I would have... Um, people say, oh, this one looks very reductive yeah. under, because it's under screw cap. And I was like, I, I don't understand why would it be reductive and it's probably because... It was made yeah. to be reductive, yeah. right? And then they put a screw cap on it instead of a cork yeah. and, and corks leak a bit. So it wasn't reductive there. But yeah. now, I mean, think of the advantage. You can make a really low sulfur wine, put it under screw cap and you're set. And the irony being that, like natural wine producers yeah. who, you know, try to limit the amount of SO two they're adding are putting, putting their it on wines a cork. Under cork. It's just goofy, I, I, silly. <laughs> but that's okay. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna push somebody for a closure. My my dream with Corbin was any wine, any amount you want, whenever you want, without having to think about it again. When you're gonna drink that bottle, and any wine, any closure, still are sparkling. Um, and so, you know, I drink. I drink more and more screw cap, but I. 
uh, it's only because of the of the screw cap uh, adapter that we now have. Um, so it's the same Corvin, uh, and all we do is we swap out the cap that's on the bottle. You quickly open it and quickly put our screw cap on it. It has the same wine facing material as is on the inside of a screw cap. It actually winds up being Saran wrap, uh, Saran or PVDC. Uh, and then we have a, sil a medical silicon rubber seal like you would use for very high uh, quality pharmaceuticals uh, that doesn't transfer any taste or smell uh, to do the resealing. So uh, uh, it's, it's, our, it's our latest addition and the goal is to be able to expand Corvin use to these great screw cap lines that are being made. And it's, uh, Australia has done the heavy lifting uh, along with New Zealand of proving to people it's a great closure. Uh, and it's you see it more and more in Europe as well, in Germany and Austria in particular. Austria, uh, certainly, in my big family time. is Austrian. <laughs> so we, we do see a lot of it. And I'm a big fan of the Wachau and, and Grunewald Liner and, and the Rieslings from there. Um, but it's uh, I see it only increasing over time. Um, and, you know, there's always going to be legacy wine out there with cork uh, going back vintage, so Corvin will be relevant even if cork goes away. But why should it limit what you're drinking? And I found I was getting frustrated. I, I'd, I'd buy a wine by the closure. Like, if it was under screw cap, I wouldn't buy it. Somebody would tell me, oh, that's great. I was like, yeah, but it's under screw cap. I use Corvin a lot, and I'm not going to be able to drink it the way I want to drink it. And I, I was, I was, it was actually one of our engineers who said, I love screw cap wine. We need a screw cap solution. This is bothering me. And, and he came up. He's a great designer. He came up with the original design uh, of it. And we've gone through, we, we did it. We launched Corvin in 2013 in the United States. The first screw cap prototype, prototype was in 2014, uh, and we've been trying to perfect it for two, three years. Uh, but one of my strong beliefs in uh, in Coravin is that that you have to pay respect to the people who were involved in the in winemakers. Uh, without them, our product wouldn't exist. Um, and then with screw cap, I wanted to pay respect to Australia and New Zealand for what this region has done for screw cap closures. So we've launched only in Australia. Um, and we're going to launch next in New Zealand. And then when we have uh, the approval of uh, the, the tacit, the, 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 the overall approval of Australia, the winemakers, the restaurants, that the screw cap is okay, uh, then we'll bring it elsewhere. Um, and my, my hope, um, I, I can't wait to be demonstrating Corbin to people using Australian wines in New York. Uh, and and well, this is what I'm it. thinking about: is that you know wine wine producers in Australia and wine importers in places like New York and London, you know, and Hong Kong, Tokyo, wherever, um, they can use this in the same way that I use the Caravan with all of my imported European wines that are under cork. Yeah, you know, they they can they can take out these the, the, these wines, these samples, and you know, and and. In the same way that we've been trialing screw caps with, you know, obviously we started with Riesling in Australia, yeah. like, you know, so we've got wines going back to the 90s under screw cap. They can they can get some bottles of Grosset Riesling from the Clare Valley under screw cap and show people, hey, not only can we use screw, um, Caravan with screw cap, but we can age wines under screw cap as well. So that's going to change people's perceptions about screw cap as a seal. I I, I completely agree. I'm I'm a big fan of screw caps. I think the the there's a misperception that oxygen entry through the cork is the primary way that a wine evolves uh, over time. Yeah, and that's just not true. And the same <laughs> and that's the same as far as wine making. You know the difference between barrels and and stainless steel tanks. Yeah. You know, yeah, oh, I think I think so. I don't want to get into the wine anyway, making. Yeah. That's a, that you could get into trouble That's there. That's another guest. But uh, but closures, I do I do care about, and um, and you know, the most of the positive ev evolution of wine over time is the, are the slow chemical reactions that don't involve oxygen that are happening inside of the bottle. Yeah, you know, the dissolution of larger long chain carbohydrates and all this stuff. And, uh, it, you know, I really do, I want to, and I have never done it, would love to do a tasting of older screw cap wines. Um, I've just never had that opportunity. I'm hoping to get that opportunity uh, if, if I You've can. got the golden ticket. Yeah, well, especially yeah, now, yeah. especially now with the screw cap edition. Uh, we're we're trying to we're trying to source some because I'd love to do blind tasting with uh, wine from the '80s or '90s under screw cap, Corvin screw cap, and not. Uh, that would be really cool. Yeah, uh, I mean, but that's the thing. Like with with the wine trade and, and media in Australia, we've been doing, you know like comparison tastings for years and now with with the caravan and the screw cap edition it's even more applicable it was it was an interesting internal argument um and uh, for a company as young as Corvin, we still had tradition which was just goofy and we said somebody was saying to me our brand promises you can pour wine from the bottle without opening it you know we're opening the bottle and putting on our screw cap this is bad this is gonna this is gonna be bad for Corvin. and and my my comment back to him was 
Our brand promise is not pouring without opening it. Our brand promise is you can drink that bottle six months later and it's the same as if you'd never touched it. Sure. If we can deliver that to any closure, if it needs to be open for a second, we'll do it, right? That's what matters. It's the, the ability to drink that wine whenever you want, uh, in any quantity you want. And however you can get there, whatever the simplest path is of getting there, that's the goal. Um, pouring wine from a bottle without opening is a magic trick. Sure. Uh, but the benefit is what you're looking for. No, I mean, the, the trick is is when you start doing the pouring wine into the punt and drinking it. Yeah, that's, that's the trick. <laughs> um, We're making money off of that one. Uh, like, uh, on, on that Hopefully note... no one listens to your podcast. <laughs> Hopefully. I'm, sorry, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, on that note, um, I, I, I'd, I'd love to, to thank you for making some time. I really, really have appreciated having you on the show, and I'm sure that everyone who listens, because I do have listeners... No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll really uh, enjoy and appreciate and, uh, and want to find out more about Caravan and, and the, the the new screw cap edition. So um, thank you very much for your time, and and I think more importantly, thank you for uh, for inventing something that has really dramatically changed the it, game. It's really a pleasure, and it always embarrasses me when I hear that because there's so many people behind Corbin that made it the way that it that it is. It's just one person to invent, but a team that makes something happen, and and that includes the restaurants and the consumers and the lead users who take a risk on us. And it's been fantastic for me to be here in Australia. I, I love the culture. I love the community. I love an excuse to come here. So I really want us to be successful uh, in Australia and, and make and help make this happen. So I really appreciate it. People can find out more information at the Caravan website. Yeah, on the Caravan website, and then uh, we're we're available in restaurants or even restaurants that are selling it. Langton's uh, online uh, is selling us as well. So uh, we're, we're just starting off in Australia, so sure. we're a little bit harder to find, but you can definitely find it online. And there are social media channels that people can follow. But, um, but yeah, yeah, Greg absolutely. at Corbin on Twitter. Um, <laughs> you know, heading to, you know, fine wine retailers and, and you know, good restaurants, uh, and you will probably find that they're, they're utilizing the Coravan devices, and, and you can ask them as well. Yeah, get them to show you. Have um, great glass. But, uh, but thanks again, and uh, I look forward to, uh, to your next visit to Australia. Awesome. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And as always, thank you guys for listening to this episode of The Vincast. I have been James Gersbrook, otherwise known as the Intrepid Wino, uh, and I'd love for you to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Player FM, uh, Podbean, uh, lots of different ways you can do that. Uh, subscribing means that uh, you get the newest episode as soon as it becomes available, but it also really, really helps me um, get the audience uh, to grow. Um, and uh, what helps even more is if you leave a rating and a review. So please do spare five minutes, uh, give me a five-star rating and, uh, and leave a nice uh, comment um, about which episodes you might have enjoyed, which guests you might like to hear from. Uh, I'd love for you to follow me on social media, on, uh, at Intrepid Wino on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, please uh, visit my YouTube channel, which is uh, the Intrepid Wino YouTube channel. Uh, uh, come and visit me at intrepidwino.com. There's lots of different ways of getting in contact with me there. Uh, and you can see lots of different content that I've put up, um, whether it's my, my blog that I, uh, I write. I haven't done much writing of late, but uh, uh, also my YouTube channel can be viewed there. But uh, guys, uh, I've got uh, some awesome guests coming up, I hope, very soon. Uh, and I'll keep plugging away with new episodes. But uh, uh, until next time, bye.